Hey, Miss Caitlin Moran herself. Hello. <laughs> We've just been standing backstage, just dancing. <laughs> Buenas tardes, muchísimas gracias a todos por venir, a Juan Bas y a Carolina Antivero por, por hacerme este regalo inmenso de, de, bueno, de darme la oportunidad de estar aquí con Caitlin, que es un, es un honor, un placer y estoy segura de que nos vamos a reír un montón. Y, y bueno, yo no sé si hay alguien que no sepa exactamente quién es Caitlin Moran, eh, así que voy a hacer una breve introducción. Eh, Caitlin Moran es una escritora y periodista, eh, vive en Londres, eh, tiene una columna dos veces a la semana en el Times y bueno, ya empezó súper joven, con 16 años, si no me equivoco, eh, tenía una, una columna, empezó como periodista musical. Eh, todas estas aventuras en el periodismo musical están contadas en una novela autobiográfica buenísima que se llama Cómo se hace una chica, de la que hay una película que todavía no, eh, creo que no se puede ver en España, pero que pronto se podrá ver. Tiene después una secuela que es Cómo ser famosa y esa sería como la línea de ficción. Después, eh, bueno, su, digamos, bestseller internacional es Cómo ser mujer. Es un libro que yo creo que es de 2011, pero a España llegó en 2013 y, y bueno, eh, creo que fue un poco algo que, que todas estábamos esperando, ¿no? Alguien que fuera eh, feminista, pero absolutamente divertida, ¿no? Y que dijera las cosas pero que, no, que la gente no sintiera que era un coñazo oírla, ¿no? Y, y, y así es como la gente se implica y se queda a escuchar lo que, lo que tiene que decir, que es muy importante, pero eso no significa que, que no se pueda decir entre risas. Eh, bueno, el libro eh, Cómo ser mujer fue un, un éxito total. Eh, digamos que cubría los, pues, la construcción ¿no? de, de la mujer. Cómo llegas a ser mujer, como que acababa, digamos, en los 30 eh, y unos diez años después, Kaylin Moran siente que ya ha hecho el trabajo duro, ¿no? que es tener a sus hijas, haber escrito un libro sobre cómo ser mujer, y entonces se da cuenta de que ahora tiene por delante una tarea incluso más complicada, ¿no? que es cómo, eh, cómo ser mujer madura. Y, y bueno, es lo que, lo que cuenta en este libro, más que una mujer, que es eh, absolutamente desternillante como la anterior, quizá un poco más serena, eh, en algunas cosas, pero que hace propuestas muy concretas de las que luego espero que podamos hablar y, y que, bueno, que, que salió en 2000, o sea, es de este año y bueno, que está disponible y que os recomiendo totalmente. Bueno, bueno. Well. I agree with everything you with just everything. said. With yeah, everything, I, I know. Sounded, it sounded about right. I'm, I'm yeah. good with that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Miss Kaylin Moran herself, I can't believe we are here. I don't know how it could be better. Maybe if we were up in the chair, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it could be better if we had wine, I think. Uh, <laughs> Have you all got a drink? <laughs> what? What? We all need wine. Feminism is better with wine. <laughs> Everything is better Everything with wine. Everything is better with wine. <laughs> Women need wine. That's what gives us energy and hope. <laughs> Uh, where we are here to talk about your last published book because you are you have finished a new one. Yes, yes. Uh, more than a woman. Um, I have to tell you that you missed making a joke about the Bee Gees song, <laughs> 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 but not bad is perfect. Not even you. <laughs> yes. Well, the Bee Gees are always in my heart. So yes. <laughs> okay. I really like it, How to Be a, a Woman, a book who make the feminism blow up in some way. And it, it was an international success. And, and then when you thought the work was almost done, you know, you realized that there was another stage on womanhood. Yes. <laughs> and surprise, yeah. it was not an easy one. Yeah. Well, women always have problems, don't they? Like that's, if you had to describe what a woman is to aliens from another planet, You would just say, we're a list of problems. And hopefully by the end of our lives, we might have solved half of them. So in the first book, How to Be a Woman, the idea was that at the time, no one was really talking about feminism in England. It was seen as a very academic thing. And people generally thought that feminists were just really angry women who hated men. And I love angry women who hate men. <laughs> They've got a lot done but there's a lot more to feminism than that. And I wanted to write something that was funny 
and warm that anybody could read and go, oh, that's what feminism is. I can see how the problems that I've had this morning could be solved by feminism this afternoon. And in the first book, the problems were about my life between the ages of 13 and 30. So I was dealing with periods, breasts, pubic hair, abortions, eating disorders, bad boyfriends, why we spend so much money on weddings, um, <laughs> all the high heels, the craziness of being a young woman. And, uh, and then it, in the years after that, a lot of other women started writing about feminism in the same way and making movies and TV shows and writing books about the problems of being a young woman, drinking too much wine, fucking the wrong men, not knowing who you are. And then I realized that, you know, 10 years after that book, there was another job that needed to be done, which is that we don't talk about the next stage of being a woman, which is when you can't go around drinking and worrying about your hair and who you're having sex with, because you are now a middle-aged woman, <laughs> and your problems are everybody else's problems. You are looking after your elderly parents who are sick or dying. You're looking after your teenage children. Your friends are getting divorced, and you have to help them through it. You're still trying to keep your marriage together. You're dealing with aging. And no one writes about middle-aged women. Like that's, there are no movies about how to be an amazing middle-aged woman. And middle-aged women are the ones that keep society together. This is the work that we do every day. We are superheroes. We are the ones solving other people's problems. But whenever I met middle-aged women, they would always say, no, don't talk about me. I'm too boring. My life is very boring. And I wanted to write a book that made them the stars and went, no, your lives are incredible. You're doing the most important work in the world. Your job is loving people and saving people. And you need a book written about you and the fact that every day you are like a superhero, like Batman. Batman saves the world all the time, but no one knows it's Batman who's doing it. And that's what it's like being a middle-aged woman. We are all Bruce Wayne, and in our spare time, we are saving the world but no one knows it's Bruce Wayne who's doing this. And that's the book that I wanted to write. <laughs> we could say that your book is an act of uh, generosity, even, even if it's a way of make a living too. Yes, as well. yeah, yeah. Because you've got to make rent is the first rule of being a woman. Like, yeah. we, we need to get paid. Yeah, we need to be uh, economic, uh, economically independent. But the fact that you help other women not to stumble in the same place uh, you did, you know, like avoid all the obstacles in the... Well, yeah, so I didn't go to school and I didn't go to university. And so everything that I know is from reading books and watching TV and watching movies. And what I found very quickly is there are two kinds of books. There are books that are fun to read, and books that when you read them, you know the writer put everything they know into that book. That's everything they have learned in their life so far in that book. And so when you read it, it's like you've lived your life and that writer's life. And if you find another book like that, then it's like you've lived your life, that writer's life, and another writer's life. And suddenly, you have the experience of 10, 20, 30 people in your head. And that's how we make our lives better. Women telling each other their problems and how they've solved them. I will only write about bad things that have happened in my life when I've found a way to solve that problem. You know, I don't like to complain or moan. You can start by saying how difficult it is to be a woman, but by the end of the book, you need someone to have gone, and here's how I solved it, and here's how I made things better. And that's what I want to do. I want to write useful books that a woman can pick up and by the end of it go, oh, okay, she's had the same problems as me. I know how to solve them. Yeah. <laughs> um, at, at the same time, there, there's some kind of uh, inevitability things, no, but uh, because everybody wants uh, freedom to make their own mistakes and they had the right to. <laughs> uh, talking about uh, motherhood, before having children, uh, we all think that we will do it better. Of course. We could manage to work and having kids and everything. And the resume is, no, you won't. <laughs> right. well, the best thing, the thing I love writing about the most is all the times that I've been an idiot 
Yeah. Every time I fucked up, every time I got something wrong, every time I changed my mind. Like, that's the interest. The two most interesting things anyone can tell you is every time they made a terrible mistake and their life went wrong. And to talk about the things that other people are too scared to write about. And when I was much younger, I knew I wanted to write books and make movies and TV shows. But I thought that the books and TV shows and movies that I wrote would have to be like the ones that already exist, that basically I would have to write Star Wars. That's what a movie was. <laughs> and it was only when I got to the age of 30 that I realized Star Wars already exists. What doesn't exist? What stories haven't I seen? What women have I not seen in a movie? What are the secrets? What are the shameful things? What are the taboos? Where's the dark stuff that people don't want to talk about? That's what I want to write about. Whenever I see a secret, that's what I run towards, going, ah, that's where I'm going to be for the next year now. Let's talk about these things. Because as a reader, that's the stuff that you enjoy reading the most. When someone's telling you a secret, when someone's telling you their most shameful moment, when someone's going, here's where I went wrong, this is yeah. why I've changed my mind. Like, that's... That's the gossip, right? Like, I, I don't want to write a book that just goes, I'm really clever, and I've solved all these problems. I want to write a book that's got all the gossip in it. You know, I will tell you how I have sex with my husband. Like, kind of like, you deserve to know that. <laughs> You're going to read my book. <laughs> I want to know how everyone has sex with their husbands. Like, that's the interesting stuff. Tell me about that. <laughs> how are you managing it? <laughs> We're all so busy. That's why you have to schedule it. If you still like your husband, yeah. you will never spontaneously have sex with them for all the time that you have children. You know, that will never happen. You'll never get to 2.30 in the afternoon and be like, let's spontaneously have sex now. <laughs> You're too busy. You have to go, I will meet you on Friday at 9.30 when the children have gone to school and we'll have sex then. And even if you're not into it for the first five minutes, after six minutes, you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> This is like going to the cinema. I always forget that I do really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the general advice uh, to, to have uh, children and manage to have a career is uh, don't marry a cunt. Don't marry a cunt. Yes, it's the best piece of advice. <laughs> you will marry your glass ceiling. I'm 47 now, so my life and my friends are like an experiment. And without exception, every woman that I know that's happy and doing well in her career is married to a man who does at least 50% of the childcare and homework. And every woman I know who is unhappy and not doing well in her career is married to a man who does 49% or less. Because all we have in our lives is time and energy. And if you're having to do more than your partner, then your life will go like that. You don't have time to be happy. You don't have time to have your career. So you, the, the possibilities in your life are limited by the man that you marry. And that's a sad but truthful fact that I have to tell young women. Don't marry a bad boy. Don't marry, <laughs> don't marry a sexy man with a motorbike. <laughs> He writes poetry and wears a hat. <laughs> like, when your children have flu and are being sick everywhere, what's he going to do? Sit there and write a poem? No. <laughs> You want the man who's going to put on the rubber gloves and start clearing up the sick. That's who you want to marry. So, yeah. So, really early on, it's why it's a good idea to drink a lot of wine when you meet a new boyfriend. When you're sick, <laughs> see how he responds to that. <laughs> that will tell you what kind of father he's going to be. <laughs> well, um, Kaylin, I think now it's time to talk about vaginas. Vaginas, yes, I do vaginas. I am the vagina expert. <laughs> My children, when they were little, someone asked them what mummy's job was, and they said, talking about vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> But it's so crazy to me that there's still something that we find it really difficult to talk about. Yeah. Like kind of, and a lot has changed in the last 10 years. Like when I wrote my book, the first book, and I talked about female masturbation and about getting to know your vagina. In Great Britain, that was seen as a scandal. I was invited onto the big news show, the big news show at 10 o'clock in the evening, and the, the big famous news presenter, Jeremy Paxman, just said to me, why have you written about masturbation? <laughs> and I said, because it's a really great hobby. <laughs> 
It doesn't cost anything, it doesn't make you fat, and it really relaxes you. And that's a good hobby. And also, it's really important. If you're a teenage girl and you first start having sexual feelings, you need to know what you like. Because otherwise, we'll live in another generation of girls who think that sex is something that a man will come and show them how to do it. That a man will come and have sex on you. Yeah. And you just lie there, hoping he knows what you want. You want to be the kind of girl who can go, oh, no, I don't oh, like that. Or, oh. Oh, my darling. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Now I'm happy. Thank you so much. God, I love this fucking country. Can I smoke on stage as well? Can we, can we do this properly? Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Okay, we're here all night, right? We can stay all night now. Yeah. This is good. Now, now this is perfect. <laughs> oh, that's good shit. Yeah, wow. it's good. Mm. So yeah, it's really like you know, it, it's it, you know, it's politically important that young girls know what sex they like, that they know how this works. You know, let's be honest. The penis is a very easy thing to use. <laughs> this is very complicated. Yeah. You know how you have to know how to use it. Like kind of because you need to tell a man what to do. You have to go I like this. I don't like this. If you haven't masturbated and you don't know how to make yourself come, you can't tell a man that. You won't know. You've got to hope that you meet someone who can guess what's going to work for you. And life is too short for that. I want to go in there with a list. Do this, do that. <laughs> this side is better than that side. <laughs> Give it another 10 minutes. That's the information that you need to know. <laughs> right, yes? Yes. <laughs> but uh, besides of the loves, uh, uh, your books work as a take off the guiltiness, you know? It removes guiltiness on, on women, guilty about uh, body, guilty about asking of an increase in, in, the, in their jobs or just talking about money like that? Women are guilty about ever having an opinion or asking for something. I can remember when I was 14, being so scared that it would take me more than two minutes to orgasm if a man was using his hand. I was worried his hand might get tired and that I was the kind of man who would make a man's hand exhausted if it took me more than two <laughs> minutes to come. I was guilty about this. We can't be guilty about what we need. Like, so much of being a woman is just pretending that we're little and we don't need anything. And like, yes, I'll come in 30 seconds. And oh, I don't eat. And like, kind of, I don't drink. And I don't swear. And I'm a good person. And even when we are good at what we do, and when we are bosses and leaders and successful, we still have to pretend that we are failures. The amount of famous women that I have seen doing interviews where someone will go, you're very successful, and they'll go, no, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> I fall over all the time. Like, I'm just, oh, I'm just crazy. Like, no, stand up and say, no, I'm really good at what I do. Like, I'm clever. I'm successful. I know what I do. I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to pretend to fall over and be a cute little doll girl. Like, kind of, women need to stand up and take their space and go, yeah, I can do this. I know what I think. You know, I, I'm, I'm capable. I, I am a grown woman. I'm not a, I'm not a baby doll. I'm not a silly girl. I'm a grown woman. Because not only will you feel better about yourself, but our children are watching us. And this is the thing that motherhood has made me realize the most. Our teenage girls are watching us. And if 13-year-old girls are watching successful women having to pretend that they're still idiots, Why would they want to grow up? We have to make the job of being a grown adult woman look good, look fun, look like something they want to do. Or our little girls won't want to grow up. They won't want to be women. They won't want this job. And I think being a grown woman is the best job in the world. I love men. The next book I'm writing is about men. But I don't want to be a man. I think being a woman's amazing. <laughs> I think we're the best. Like, I'm just like... Yeah. You know, men are incredible, but like, I'm team tits. I'm team vagina. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of, of, thing, of reasons that women have to be grateful with you. One is this, and another is that you talk about uh, topics that 
usually we feel guilty to talk about too. You know, it's like uh, when a writer uh, has uh, chi has chi children, it's like, oh, don't write a book about motherhood because everybody does and you are doing the same. But you do uh, in a fresh, a new way, and this is wonderful. Thank <laughs> so you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, the thing I want to do the most is. In the last 10 years, so many women have written brilliant books about motherhood, very honest things about what birth is like, how difficult it is, how amazing it is. And I'm just so confused that men are not writing books about being fathers. Yeah. It's still the job of being a parent. Women are being so honest and truthful and sharing all their information and helping each other. And I don't understand why men aren't talking about being fathers. I had this insane revelation, I went to a bookshop a couple of months ago, and there's a whole section on women, feminism, philosophy, all about women, self-help books, all for women. There is no man section. Men aren't giving each other advice. Part of a woman's job, half of my job is working for money and writing. The other half of my job is doing feminism for free. I'm always signing petitions, I'm helping young women. I'm, you know, I go to parliament and talk about new laws and legislations to help women. Men of my generation are not doing that for young boys. And I find this so confusing that, that still the job of being a human being, it's only women who are talking about it and going, how can we change? What is a woman? How can women be better? How can we help women? Can women change? What are the new things that women can do now? Men are having no conversations about how being a man could change, about how men's lives can be bigger, about the new things that men could learn, about how men's lives can be better. And I, 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 I find that, I think this is the biggest problem now. I've spent 10 years writing about women and increasingly I'm thinking the next big job is to write about men because it can't be women who are the ones that always start the conversation going, how will we both have jobs and look after our children? How should sex be? How can we change politics? You know, men need to join in that conversation, which is why any woman who ever says to a man, you can't be a feminist because you're a man, is no friend of feminism. We need as many people as possible talking about how we can change women's lives. And then I hope the next thing that would happen if men can be involved in feminism is men see what feminism has done for women, how it's changed our lives in the last hundred years, how we can now be in parliament, we're going into space, we have the vote, we have contraception, we have all this power. Women's lives have changed and improved so much in the last hundred years. But men's lives are almost exactly the same as they were a hundred years ago. And for our young boys, what I hear time and time again is young men saying it's easier to be a young woman now than it is to be a young man. And we've really fucked up if that's how our young men feel. And the only people I see talking about how men can change are writers like Jordan B. Peterson, who are saying, be more of a man, be more alpha, more patriarchy. But those aren't the problems that young men have. The leading cause of death in Britain for men under the age of 50 is suicide. Men are literally dying because they can't talk about how sad they are. Well, I know someone who's really good at talking about your emotions. It's women. <laughs> we have so much to tell you. We can teach you all these things. Women have taken all these things from the world of men. Politics, power, money, confidence, sex. Men need to start taking things from the world of women. Talk about your emotions, talk about your depression, talk about your anxiety. Talk about how you want to make your worlds bigger. Talk about how you want to change the idea of what a man is. Because we've changed the idea of what a woman is so much in the last hundred years. Now men need to do that. You know, I, I want your lives to be bigger. I want you to feel that you can change the whole idea of what it is to be a man. And that will make all of us happier. This is, you know, we can't raise another generation of boys who think that their lives are going to be the same as their grandfather's. They need to start thinking they are the future in the way that young women do now. And we need to start writing songs about how cool it is to be a boy. Because all the songs at the moment are about how cool it is to be a girl. Where are the songs about how cool it is to be a boy? That's where you know that there's something going wrong. You know, as soon as we get a male Beyonce writing a song about how boys rule the world, 
That's what I want to see next. Let's make boys as happy as we've made girls. One... One of the... Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, yes, yes. <laughs> because ultimately, these are all the problems of humans. Yeah. Like the idea that there are man problems and girl problems. They're the problems of humans. And I, I think that women have so much to teach men now. And, you know, the, well, that's the next book I'm writing, basically. I, I spent 10 years thinking, surely a man will write a book about this. Where are the men writing a book about this? And the biggest question that I get asked as a feminist, having spent all these years writing about women and children, the first question I always get asked is, but what about men? <laughs> And for years, I was like, well, I don't care. <laughs> I'm here for the women. But now, I'm like, no, what about the men? How can they change? Like, let's, let's start talking about young boys in the same way that we talk about young girls. On the book, you say that often we require uh, women, uh, women to always be the voice of her gender. You yes. know, like, in, in every single step, a woman makes, uh, we make that she carry the weight of representing ha half of the world population. Yes. And you say, okay, sometimes a woman is just a woman. Right. So this is, so I've looked at the statistics in this. When women are given a very high profile job in a company, the first time they make a mistake, they tend to get fired. Whereas with men, you make three or four mistakes before you get fired. And that's because when we give a woman some power, the first time she makes a mistake, we're like, oh, well, that was an experiment that didn't work. That woman is seen to represent all women. And we can't represent half the world's population. We just have to be another human being with a job. And time and time again, when you talk to women, they're so worried that when they make a mistake, it's not just their mistake. They're letting all women down. And that's an intolerable burden. You know, we can't, we have to be able to just own our own mistakes. Like, you know, I'm responsible for what I fuck up. <laughs> I'm, I'm not taking 3.4 billion women with me yeah. when I can't make the photocopier work. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that your book is about being a, a woman who is getting older, of course, but also it's, it's, uh, it's about changing your mind. We, we, you just uh, tell it. Do, do you have changed your mind on some affairs? Botox? Yes, Botox. Yoga? Yes, yoga, yes. <laughs> so Botox, so this was when I wrote the first book. I mean, I'll be honest, I didn't know what Botox was. So I just thought it was that really kind of like... <clears throat> I thought that was that Botox. And aesthetically, I don't like that look. So that's what I thought Botox was. And then I have a friend who just looked very happy. <laughs> I couldn't understand. I, I kept saying, have you been on holiday? And she was like, no. How do you mean? Yeah. Packing yeah. all the morning. Are you sleeping really well? She was like, no. And in the end, she told me what it was, that she gets Botox. And I didn't know what it was. And basically, as we get older, you know, it's hard to be a woman. And I found that when I, if I see myself in the mirror when I'm typing, my face is like this. <laughs> and what Botox does, and then when I'd see myself in the mirror, I'd go, I need to relax my face, and I would make the decision to relax my face, and I would become a professional face relaxer, and I would like spend five minutes relaxing my face again. And what Botox does is just take that job away and just relaxes your face for you, and it just makes you look like you've gone on a holiday. <laughs> and in feminism, this has become a really big subject. Is it a bad, are you a bad feminist if you have Botox? But it's okay if you're a feminist to have a facial, to put a face pack on. It's okay if you're a feminist to whiten your teeth. It's okay if you're a feminist to dye your hair. But this one thing, a lot of feminists are like, no, that's too far. <laughs> it takes far longer to put a face pack on and massage your face and dye your hair and bleach your teeth than it does to just go to a doctor and get Botox put in. It takes two minutes, it lasts six months, and it means that when you look in the mirror, you don't look really, really sad. <laughs> like, do you have the Gruffalo here? The children's character, the Gruffalo? Does that happen here? Yeah, yeah. the Gruffalo. Yeah, the Gruffalo. The Gruffalo. I looked like the Gruffalo. <laughs> Botox? No more Gruffalo. Like, that's... <laughs> and, 
And the, the reason that all my friends have had it is when we would look in the mirror, we would see a really sad and angry woman, but we didn't feel sad. Our face looked sad and angry, but we don't feel like that inside. So this is, Botox just lets you look how you feel on the inside. That said, I haven't had it for a year because I can't be bothered and I wanted to spend the money on these shoes instead. So <laughs> you can literally, or everything I ever do when I write is just going, we shouldn't have to have secrets. We shouldn't feel guilty. We live in a world where women are judged by how they look. If you want to go and do this thing that's very effective and lasts for six months, go and do it. <laughs> Don't feel guilty. I will give you a feminist argument for doing this if you want. <laughs> But ultimately, we shouldn't have to explain what we're doing. <laughs> Just leave us alone. <laughs> this is why we look so tired and sad, because we have to explain everything we do. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't need the fucking Botox if everyone just left us alone. <laughs> so in, in, the, in the book, Caitlin, you, you propose two very concrete things. A salary for housekeeping and till curry. Yes. And a union trade of women. So a union for women. So fem when I first started writing about feminism, I didn't really know what it was. I thought that there were probably 50 books that I would read and I would learn the rules of feminism. And I would find out who the feminist god was and I would understand it and know how to be a good feminist. And then the more I write about feminism and I read about feminism, I realize That's not feminism. Feminism is a pop culture, crowdsourced phenomenon. Feminism is a million women across the world, ordinary women who weren't being paid to be feminists, who saw a problem and came up with a solution for it. And that's what feminism now, this amazing global network of millions of ideas that women have shared with each other. And I can't remember what the question was. Go on, what was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the union trade. Oh, so, yes, but what you notice about feminism, and this is one of the biggest complaints that people have rightly about feminism, it tends to be very white and middle class because the only women who have time to identify problems yeah. in women's lives and do something about it are the wealthier women who tend to be white. So we need to have a feminism where women get paid, where women from all socio-economic backgrounds and all colors and all religions can feel that they've got time to do feminism. We need to have paid feminists. We need to have that to be a profession so that they can go to parliament and every time we have a new piece of legislation, they can look at it and go, but how does this affect women? And the only way we can do that all the way through history is we form unions. We form a union, you pay your dues, we have professionals who will represent us full time. If you have a union representing you, then that saves you time. I would so happily pay a union 10 pounds a year to go and do feminism for me. <laughs> At the moment, I and every other woman has to do feminism unpaid and in our spare time. So we need a union that will talk to governments, that will make sure any new laws think about how it will affect women's lives and so we can have more representative feminism. So everyone, whatever their background, can afford the time to be a feminist. So, you know, I love the idea of a women's union. I just think it would be, you know, a sisterhood across the world of paid professional feminists with lawyers and time and money who can stand up and go, how does this affect women? What you're doing now, how does this affect the women? Is this good for women or bad for women? And if you've got a union and they can stand up and go, this legislation is bad for women, they can tell the voters, don't vote for this party. Don't vote for this government. This government doesn't represent you. At the moment, there's no way that women can know if a political party is going to help them or fuck up their lives really badly for the next 10 years. And, <laughs> and what about the salary? Of the salary for housekeeping and everything? And so, oh God, so I'm a writer and as soon as I started earning money, I got an accountant. And sitting and talking to this accountant radicalized my feminism more than I ever thought it would. So I was talking to him about what I can claim against tax. What, what as a writer are the things that I can use in my accounts that will be paid for? 
and he said, do you play golf? I was like, no. He went, well, that's a pity. If you played golf, you could claim your golf clubs and membership to a golf club against your tax because it's presumed that you would be going and playing golf with other people in your industry and that's how you'd get some business. So you can go and play golf for free and we'll claim it against your tax. And I was like, you're fucking kidding me. <laughs> we still can't claim childcare against tax. That, that's the biggest thing that would change women's working lives if you could claim childcare as an expense, but I could go and play golf instead. And that's where you realize that the tax laws and the accountants, they came up with all the rules at a time when it was only men working and they favor the working lives of men. And it's just extraordinary to me that the biggest thing that, that dictates a woman's career once she has children is who's gonna look after the kids while mummy goes and earns some money. And there is no government help for that whatsoever. But I could go and play golf all weekend for free. <laughs> this is... You know, and every country's different. I'm sure you've got some mad stuff here. But <laughs> there is no government that puts childcare at the center of their economic policies. And for half the world's population, that's the most important news they will ever hear. Who's going to look after the kids while mummy makes the money? Yeah. In, in your books, you use your experience. That uh, means you talk about your husband and your daughters, and sometimes you tell funny things, but uh, also other times you, you talk about painful things. So how do they take it, and how do you, as a family, manage all this thing? Well, so we went for lunch earlier, and we drank some wine, and I told you lots of things about yeah. my family. <laughs> that I would never write about yeah, in books. <laughs> so like this is, I write about such a small, I write a small bit about what's happening in my life to make it interesting. And then I basically talk about politics. But I think that as a reader, I want to know the gossipy personal things before someone tells me how they want to change the world. That seems polite. So my daughter was very, very ill about five years ago. She became very depressed and anxious and then she developed an eating disorder where she was anorexic, she didn't eat. She tried to kill herself three times. She took multiple overdoses, she self-harmed. And I realized that, I, I think generally I am a very good mother, but I had this terrible flaw. My fault was that I had been raised in a family where if you were sad, no one cared. Like if you were sad, the whole vibe was, forget it cheer up, you know, don't talk about it. And you can't tell someone who is mentally ill to cheer up and not talk about it. And I realized that I was scared of sadness. That was my big flaw. That if, if someone is sad, I want to either tell a joke or I want to give them facts, tell them don't be sad because it's wrong to be sad. I've looked on Google. <laughs> or I want to just, you know, I want to be angry with them. Like, don't be sad. It's making me sad. Or I'll cry and hope that they will see that it's upsetting me that they're sad and that will stop them being sad. None of that works if you have a mentally ill child. What you have to do and what I learned to do was to be able to look them in the eye and go, I can see you are sad. I'm not scared of that. I'm so sorry that things are so bad for you. You can tell me everything and I am going to be with you all the way through this. And we will get through this and you will get better, but I am not scared. You can talk to me. And unfortunately, it took me two years to learn that that was what she needed to hear. And thankfully, once I started doing that, she got better. And she told me to write about it in this book because she is now She's completely better, thankfully. In fact, she's too well. She's, she's got too much energy, <laughs> and she's too argumentative, <laughs> and she's too much. <laughs> But she told me, my generation, we talk about mental health all the time, on TikTok and on Instagram. Like, we don't have any shame or taboo about mental health. But your generation, our parents, you don't talk about this. You grew up when these things were very shameful. And that means you can't help us. That means you're a problem. And you need to write about this in this book 
because you need to tell the parents how to help us. And so I wrote about it in the book, and I have to say of all the things I've ever written about, it had the most incredible response. I worked for the Times in London, the newspaper, and we publicized, we took an extract of the book about my daughter um, has eating disorder and put it in the paper. And I had thousands and thousands of letters from parents going, thank you. I couldn't find anyone who talks honestly and truthfully about what happens when your children are so depressed that they want to die. And you have given me the language to understand this and you have given me the language and the script to start talking to my children about it. Because I couldn't find it anywhere else. I read every book that you can read about mental illness and eating disorders, and no one would tell you what you needed to know as a parent to save your child. Um, and it, uh, you know, those are the moments where you realize, you know, the, the, it, I love my job, but those are the moments where you go, oh God, that's all I've ever wanted to do. If I can be useful, if I can save someone, if I can give someone a piece of advice that makes their life better, then my job is done. Like kind of, you know, I can retire now. Um. And I suspect statistically that there are parents in the audience now who are dealing with this because it's huge. And I suspect there are probably some people crying in the audience right now just thinking about this. And if you want to talk to me later, like kind of please come and talk to me about it. Like I, I want to help you. It's, I, I am so sorry you are going through this. It's the hardest thing in the world. Um, and there is hope and your children can get better. And um, yeah, please come and talk to me later because I, I feel for you. It's the worst thing in the world. It's every parent's nightmare. Children, you know, there is a lot of energy that take from us as a, as a writer, as a woman, but they um, give us a lot of things, like you, you just uh, tell that, but also a new way to look to the world. And yes. I think that uh, maybe writers who have children should not be scared of, um, you know, of take this and use for their jobs. Totally, like we, you know, our lives are so short, and like, you know, my children are 21 and 18 now, and at the time, it felt like parenthood went on forever. <laughs> I was so, I was yeah. so tired. <laughs> parenthood feels so long when your children are little, but it goes really quickly. And anything that helps you during that time to not only solve the problems, but just enjoy it more. It's magic that you can make a person that's in your life forever. Like, having children is incredible. I think we sometimes complain too much about being parents because we're so very tired. <laughs> but it is magic. So any advice that people can give you that means that you can get to the good bit <laughs> as soon as possible and solve the problems is the most useful thing that you can do in anyone's life. And I love the fact that you know, 50 years ago, people did not talk about parenthood. There was a complete silence about it. You were not supposed to talk about how difficult it was and the truth of it. And things have changed so much now. We are so truthful and honest about parenthood, but we, we need to remember, ultimately, it's a beautiful and joyful thing. And so much of what I write is like, yes, let's talk about the problems, but we have to remember that whenever we're talking about the problems of being a woman or being a parent or being a teenage girl, whatever it is, that the point is that we're supposed to solve these problems. We're supposed to make sure they don't happen to our children so we can get to the point of being alive, which is to be happy, which is to be joyful. Like, you know, I, 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 I can't wait for a time, I genuinely believe there'll be a point where we don't need feminism anymore. The point of feminism is that one day we don't need it anymore because we believe that women are equal and we have solved all the problems that are uniquely female. And that I will talk to my granddaughters, and they'll go, what did you used to do? And I'll say, I used to be a feminist. And they go, what's that? Well, there used to be a time when people didn't think women were equal to men. And they were like, what? We've got to get to the bit where we solve all these problems. We could change it in a generation. 
and get to the point of life, which is to be happy, which is to be joyful. It's to walk around and point at amazing things. Like walking around Bilbao today, I went to the Guggenheim Museum, and it's so full of the most excellent things that human beings have done. It's so beautiful. We are an excellent species. We are so good at making beautiful things. We are so clever. And I want us to get to the point where all we're doing is being excellent. <laughs> and we stop having to talk about these things that stop us from being able to share what we can do. Because I genuinely believe everyone in the world has one idea, it might be tiny or it might be huge, that would make the world better. And anything, whether it's sexism or racism or homophobia, that stops someone with a great idea being able to share that idea with the world and make all of our lives better, that's our biggest enemy. If everyone could share their amazing ideas about what would make the world better, all of our lives would change overnight. And that's the ultimate point of any civil rights action, anything that we do when we're talking about equality. It's to get to the bit where every genius in the world gets to make our lives better. And it doesn't matter what they look like or where they come from or what their sex is. That's, we have to remember this. It's like the goal is amazing. <laughs> This is really good wine, by the way. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm feeling so clever and kind of sexy right now. So this is real, working really well for me. <laughs> the, all of their books are full of uh, songs and films and books that you love, not necessarily feminist books. Mm. And I think... Um, I think this, uh, this is why uh, your books are, are so, so closed and so easy reading and so easy to be in. So. Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, when, when you, if you write, you know, ultimately I'm a political writer, but when, often when people write about politics, it's seen as this abstract, distant thing that's happening in a government somewhere far away. But our lives are political. You know, what you're wearing, the transport that you took here to get here today, the food that you eat, how we raise our children, these are all influenced by political decisions. So if you're writing about politics, you have to start with what's happening in your life today. That's why the format of this book is one day in my life, from 7 a.m. to 7 a.m., 24 hours, and just talking about everything that happens every hour and talking about why my life is like this now because of the politics and the culture. But the reason that I talk so much about movies and films and books and songs is because culture is the fastest way to change things. If you're looking for politics to change your lives, even if today we came up with an amazing new law that made everything better, it would take four or five years for that to go through Parliament and change our lives. Pop culture can change things overnight. The feminist motto, I cannot be what I cannot see, is my favorite motto. Because if you see a woman doing something new and being happy, straight away you're like, I'll be like her. When I was a little girl watching Madonna, being able to talk about sex, no woman had talked about sex in the way that Madonna did. And now seeing Beyonce with an all-female band talking about feminism, talking about Chimamanda Ngozi Ndichie's We Should All Be Feminists. That's a whole generation of girls who are growing up listening to amazing songs, but also having their minds changed overnight, finding a whole new raft of books to read that will inform the rest of their lives. And I love pop culture. I, you know, We're here at a cultural festival to talk about humor and art and literature and movies and TV. They're so powerful. You know, governments are scared of what culture can do. Governments are scared of what humor can do. If you can make the right joke in one line, you can tell a truth that will travel across the world in a day. The amount of times that I've been writing something and I'll write 2,000 words very seriously about a political subject, and at the end, to be polite, I'll put a joke that sums up what I've been saying. And in that one line that's a joke, I'll realize I've said everything. Those 2,000 words were a very long and boring way 
of doing what a joke can do, a good, proper, true joke, the use of humour, is the fastest way to change someone's mind. Because you read a joke and you laugh before you even think. You have the emotion of, I agree yeah. with this, this touches a nerve, this is true, before you start thinking about it. And that's the power that culture has that politics does not have. We can make you feel emotional. We can tell you a truth in one line that will change the way that you think. And a politician can give a huge speech and take an hour to say what a really good comedian can do in one line. And that's why I love this festival and everything that I've seen about it. It understands that power. It understands that humor should never be thought of as a luxury or an adjunct to culture. Humor is culture. The cleverest people can say in one line what a less clever person would take two hours to say. And that's why I love this fucking festival. <laughs> so, when, when you are writing a, a book, how do you decide if it is a novel or if it is a, a, a non-fiction book? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess, so the, so the first book that I wrote, How to Be a Woman, was the story of my life. It's the story of my life from my 13th birthday till 34. And I chose every chapter to be a subject that every woman will experience. Your first period, growing pubic hair, your breasts, a bad boyfriend, getting married, having children. And then I wrote How to Be Famous, because that's also the story of my life, but it's also it's the things that happened in my life that are unusual. You know, I didn't go to school, I didn't go to university, I started presenting a TV show when I was 18. I was terrible at it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wrote books, I've traveled, I meet famous people. And so that felt like that should be fiction. I didn't want to write a book that was like, yeah, we all know Benedict Cumberbatch, right? Like, no, I know Benedict Cumberbatch. Most people don't. <laughs> That's not re relatable. Um, so, yeah, so fiction is the, is, where I put the weird things that happen in my life that are not normal okay. and the, the fun yeah. stuff. And also in fiction, the beautiful thing is you can make the kind of, when you're writing fiction and you create characters, it's very much like being a mother. You create a person and you get to mold them and shape them. I, I, in um, How to Be Famous, I created the most perfect man in the world. <laughs> He's a man called John Kite, and he's in a band. And I noticed that in all the movies and books that I've read where someone has a rock star hero, they always get it wrong. They always make them wear leather trousers and talk in poetry and have a drug problem and be stupid. And all the rock stars I know were working class boys who read books and are very political and are very clever and are very feminist. And I knew that no one would believe it if I wrote that as non-fiction. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had to make him a fictional character. Um, so yeah, fiction, fiction allows you to kind of cheat with the truth, but it's still yeah. the same thing. When you, anyone who writes a novel is still trying to tell you some truths, um, but that truth might not seem believable if you made it non-fiction. That that you do in your non-fiction books is uh, some very particular, because I think they had some of Book of Life, you know, and you share your life experience, which is very generous, and, uh, and I was thinking uh, about some uh, writers to, that do some similar things, like David Sedaris, I love David Sedaris. <laughs> oh my God. I want him to be my friend. Yeah. I'm going to have to go and stalk him. Like, I feel like he should be my friend. He's Greek and my husband is Greek. So I'm kind of like, I want to kind of introduce myself to him and go, I understand Greek people. You, and you're gay. You should love me. I'm a gay. <laughs> I, I think he'd hate me if I said that, but that's the only tactic I've come up with so far. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, thinking on. on <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking on, on Nora Ephron, that you loved. Oh, 
Nora Ephron, I adore. She's yeah. like, and again, she's one of those writers who just wants to tell you all the dirty secrets. Mm. I love a woman who's just kind of like, my favorite female writers, women, you know when you go to the ladies' toilets and the kind of conversations that the women are having in there? That's the stuff that I love the most. Every truth will be told in the female toilets. That's yeah. where we go and talk to each other. I can talk to a woman in the toilets for 10 seconds and she will tell me everything about her marriage, how she feels about her vagina, <laughs> uh, the last time she had sex, what the best sex is she had in her life, the worst sex she's had in her life, who she hates, everything. <laughs> you know, I, I've been in the ladies' toilets and we've swapped bras. Like, kind of like a woman has gone, my bra is too small. And I'll say, my bra is too big. And we'll literally take our tops off and swap bras. That's, that's the kind of truth that I love um, in a writer. Someone who you know would give you their bra if you ask them to. <laughs> also, I have to say tonight, I am premiering tonight for the first time my upper arms. I've lived my whole life being embarrassed and ashamed of my upper arms. I've generally believed that they're an internal organ that should be hidden, like my liver. <laughs> and tonight, I went out earlier to the Guggenheim and it rained on all of my clothes. <laughs> and this is all I had left. I usually sleep in this. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm not. This <laughs> Look, look, that's nice, right? That's my book. <laughs> Thank you for that because it's one of my Neymar, you know, when I brush in my teeth, it's like, oh, I, I don't want to look at the mirror. <laughs> right, but like... I think every, I, I, every woman has the, the, that Neymar. Well, my idea is tonight I am Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen <laughs> will wear, this is, look, I'm Bruce. Like, kind of like... <laughs> born in the USA. <laughs> and like, I've never known a man feel sad about their upper arms. Like Nora Ephron will go, I feel sad yeah. about my neck, I feel sad about my upper arms. And I was like, I'm 47, I'll be dead in 30 years. I just want no. to wear a vest. No, I will be, I smoke. <laughs> like, kind of like, I will be dead in 30 years and I can't spend the rest of my life not wearing a vest because I'm sad about my upper arms. Like, look at this little guy. Like, look at these little guys. <laughs> I was back combing my hair yeah. earlier, and I was combing here I saw, well. I saw. <laughs> Literally like, back comb. Yeah, like, because <laughs> I know if I'd seen a woman who had upper arms like me when I was 16, I would have been wearing a vest for the last 30 years. Like, I'm just like, yeah, just, it, I'm, I'm, I think women have a gland in their body, like the pancreas, that produces shame. <laughs> And I think I'm now diabetic. I can't produce shame anymore. I just, I just, I don't care. <laughs> also, it the helps. wine has really helped. <laughs> like, I don't know if this is normal in Spain, but everybody that I've met today has just been giving me wine all day. Like, thank you, Carolina. Like, that's, thank you. It's, it's made me feel really good about myself. <laughs> I think uh, we have no, no more time, but I, I think... Oh, you're fucking kidding me. I've got loads of drink left. But, <laughs> Kaylin, maybe you, <laughs> you can send a hug for all that women you met in the bathroom. <laughs> yes. Well, I will be in the bathroom, because I do need a wee now. So, <laughs> I will be in the bathroom in five minutes' time. <laughs> women, women, let's all meet in the bathroom in five minutes' time, right? <laughs> And we'll tell all our secrets. <laughs> right? Is that a deal? Let's do that. <laughs> okay, we have to go? Yeah, okay. we have to. See you in the bathroom in five minutes' time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Un momento, un momento. Un momento. Caitlin, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah.